Okay, I think it's about time to start here. Three minutes after six. I'm Robert Blackwell. I'm on the Conference Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, and I'm the chairman of the Public Affairs Committee. So, my task was to gather the issues with the 3A and 3B and present it to the board. The Public Affairs Committee has no power. All they can do is gather information and pass it up to the, uh, to the real deciders. That's a bad word. Six makers. So, <clears throat> I sort of bogged down. I, I've tried to teach my kids not to decide what they want until they know what it's going to cost. So, here I was trying to figure out what this is going to cost. And the numbers that are, these are my numbers, the numbers that are in the ballot text or the underlying So you don't really know what the assessed value is going to be in the property. And by the way, there's a little section of Broomfield that's in here too that I had no idea was part of us, but it is. Anyway, the assessed value that we're working on right now is this number. Um, Jim Everson thinks that next year it will be this. I don't know why. But that's what he thinks. Reassessment. Anyway, um, I bogged down here in my analysis. This is pretty simple. There's $33 million more to pay on some 1992 bonds. By the end of the year, that'll go away, and that ought to be worth four to 4.75 mils. And I don't know why. Uh, that's not a fixed number, but that's what. I'm talking about. And that's close enough together to where it doesn't bother me much. So 3A is the override that's right here. <coughs> if you had the same assessed value, you'd have this number, but it won't be. Uh, a residential building for oops, a $250,000 residential building <coughs> would pay that much tax. A uh, $250,000 business would pay this much. Then the 99 million bond is the curious part. So I did a little Excel spreadsheet, and if you paid 4% uh, for 20 years, you should have an annual bill of five million, whatever it is, six million dollars. And but the, the ballot says that uh, the maximum annual payment could be 19.8 million. And I don't understand. Maybe somebody will explain it. And, and the total, the total maximum would be 195 million, where if you did 20 years at 4%, you'd only need this number, 119. So I don't understand that. That's why I stopped and I'm glad you guys are here to help me with this. Because I need on Friday board meets and I need to tell the chamber board something. <laughs> <coughs> truth better. So there's a uh, an agenda, and that's at 610 Citizens for Jeff Go Schools, and I think that's Dr. Stevenson, and he says Steve. Steve. We were going to do education then taxation, but do you want us to do, do you want Steve to start with that since you kind of introduced that? I called him Mr. Bell, and he said that's my grandfather. Mr. Bell, come on up, Mr. Bell. <laughs> come on up, Mr. Bell. Come on up, Mr. Bell. And we have for uh, Jefferson County Students First Action, by the way, I was correct on that. Uh, actions of 501C4, and uh, Sheila Atwell will be doing that one. And she and her clerk can sit right here. So I'll set the egg timer. And if that's not good enough, I brought this. So, this is the fat thing you sing, you know you're talking. Nice, I like it. Well, what, what Steve and I had thought we would do, we have the first 10 minutes, is okay, that, yeah. oh, sorry, 11 minutes, okay, okay. is that um, I'm going to talk a bit about the Mill Levy override and the educational aspects and the reform and the efforts that Jeffco is making. Steve Bell, who is has a past, in the banking industry, 
uh, a good past in the banking industry, is here to talk a bit about the bond and the taxation. So since that was introduced, why don't we start there, and then I will tell you when your five minutes is up. Go. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, Cindy is correct. I, I did have the good fortune of being in the investment banking industry for quite some time. And this is what I did. Municipal debt financing. And the majority of my clients from New York to California were school districts by choice. So if you want to ask me questions about this, I'll try to explain as best I can. I can answer your questions. So this is accurate. I'm not sure what going away means. That we paid off. Correct. We issued bonds in 1992, okay, and it was the first cycle of what the district started as their long-term debt financing model. The debt financing model was premised upon the following. We would go to the voters on four to six year cycles, and we would ask the voters, we being the school district, for an authorization for the issuance of debt that enabled us to complete in the, in the range of 450 to $500 million of capital improvements. That was a combination of the issuance of bonds, annual contributions from the Capital Reserve Fund of the district, and <clears throat> coincidentally, because in those days we actually could earn a little interest, interest earnings on those funds. A little different than where we are today. So that model was put in place in 1992. It was followed in 1997 when we had another successful bond issue. Okay, we also had an override within a couple of years after that. It was then followed again in 2004, another cycle, and we were successful in 04. And then we went to the voters again in 2008 with a similar package. The 2008 package was, I think, 325 million or thereabouts of bonds and about a $38 million bill levy override. So the cycle and the model has been in place since 1992. And we did it with a design and a purpose. It wasn't arbitrary. The design was go to the voters periodically, get a significant amount of capital so we can fund needs over a long period of time, look for operating revenue that would help us. And we said to the voters, we're not going to come back to you every other year or every year. We're going to do this over a longer span. Now, that's work. <clears throat> I will tell you that that model has been copied by many school districts around the United States because I've passed the model on to them. So it's been one that people said, this is a good idea for us. The other premise was not only the modeling, the timing, was that we would structure the debt that allowed us to have the minimum impact that we could on our voters as we went down these cycles. Okay? 2012 <clears throat> is the first time that because we issued bonds in 20 to 22 year terms, that the bonds from 1992 are being paid. The last payment will be made December 15th of 2012. Okay, so we have for the first time since this model has been in place, the opportunity to realize that there will be a reduction in the debt service fund, and these are the right numbers because we're going to be making the last payment in 2012. Now, we knew that was going to happen. It's going to happen again in 2017 and 18. It's going to happen again in 2024 to 25. Not by accident. We made it that way. So we said, and what we're going to be able to do at that point in time is issue new debt because we'll be able to say to our voters, you know, our bill levy has been this, and we're not asking you to pay much more, if at all because this is going away, so we're going to keep it the same, and we can issue some new bonds. That's the model. Pretty good model. So that's what we're doing. So there, this is accurate. We're going to have a reduction in our bond redemption fund. Now, there are two funds that we need to be, be knowledgeable about for the district. One is this general fund, which is primarily for operational expenses. The bond redemption fund, which is voted debt authorization, is separate in its mill levy. Keep this, keep this important feature here. General fund dollars could go to pay debt if you chose. Probably not a good practice. Economics 101 says not a good idea. But debt model monies cannot go back to the general fund. So we can't say, well, gee, we'll just collect this money in the bond redemption fund and put it back in the general fund. Can't do that. So we could go one way, not the other. That's state law. 
So keep in mind that this year, 2012, we have a unique opportunity that we will have a mill levy reduction as taxpayers in Jefferson County, and I'm one of them. We then the $39 million override, these are accurate numbers. It's about, on seven billion of assessed, it's about a mill for seven dollars, or seven million dollars. It's about right, okay? So, you were taking a little bit, we're in, we're in the neighborhood of what this would be, okay? And we know that in Jeff County, I believe Jim said that the average, average across the county for home value is about 256,000. 250, give or take a little bit. Okay, so these numbers are probably pretty accurate. Okay, here, in 1992, how many people know about Tabor, Taxpayer Bill of Rights? Okay, Douglas Bruce did a real number on us in the state of Colorado. Right? He did. Because he crafted a requirement for how we structure debt questions and ballot language that's a little, well, it's a whole lot different than it used to be. And it's sometimes confusing. So we're going to the voters, we're asking the voters for $99 million of new money. Those are general obligation bonds that we will issue. Tabor requires that in our ballot language we have a few things. One is that we have to incorporate the maximum total principal and interest payment that could be made when we pay off $99 million. <coughs> Doesn't say, tell us about the term. 20 years, it says, what's the maximum payment that you might have? Total, principal, and interest. Second thing that he says, he doesn't tell you that we have to put in an interest rate, so we don't, so there isn't one in Tabor, but he then says, what is the maximum single year annual payment that could ever exist on those bonds? Doesn't say average annual payment, it says maximum annual payment. So, think about it this way. If I were to graph, here's our existing debt, and I'm going to issue new bonds. I got a couple of things that I could do. I could just issue new bonds right up here on a level debt basis, and if I did that, this payment number might be accurate. Or, or one of the options, I could issue debt that had smaller payments <coughs> here, and when these bonds, 2024, get paid off, I will then have a larger payment on this bond in exchange for a lesser payment on the front end. Okay, now, if the, if the issue is successful, we will have this very discussion with our board of directors. The board of education will say, okay, Let's talk about this because the ballot language allows us to do this. If we did it this way, right, the maximum allowable payment would be 19.8 million. Now I had somebody the other day say, well, 19.8 million, that's 20 million, and if you're gonna issue 20 million or 20 year bonds, that's 400 million dollars. Ah, but what does the maximum payment say that we can pay Principal and interest over the life is this number. It's not 400. So never could I go above this number, no matter what my structure is. And those are the discussions that will be held with our Board of Education if we're successful. So it's a matter of structuring, and it's a matter of compliance with the regulations and rules that Tabor dictates to us. I don't necessarily like them. I certainly don't agree with them, but they are what they are. So that's what we have. So we have maximum allowable. Doesn't say that's our payment every year. That's not true. We have total principal and interest, which is really the governing limit. Because I could issue 10-year bonds at 10%, as long as I only paid principal and interest of 195. Or I could issue 30-year bonds at 2%, as long as I never paid more than 195 million. Those are the discussions when we get into this with our Board of Education about how do you want to model this step, right? And we knew this opportunity would come in 2012 because we issued the bonds in 1992 with this model in place. <coughs> there you go. All right, so how many more minutes do we have to learn? Then, 
that answer that? Two okay. minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Uh, now I will take the time. five. Sorry. I will take. I will take the five minutes later. So let me do this. I'm Cindy Stevenson. I've been the superintendent of Jeffco for ten years. I am a K-12 product. So obviously I love this district as most of you know. So I'm going to tell you two things to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about when we get our next five minutes. First of all, last night I had somebody send me a video that we had used a year ago when the Jefferson Foundation honored the Chambers. I had forgotten about that video, but here's something in that video that I would ask everybody in this room to remember. It talked about the Chambers, the city governments, the county government, and the school district and what kind of a partnership we have. Second thing, I was in 100 schools not last year, and I'm starting on the next 50 today, actually yesterday. So 150 schools, and I will have visited all of them by December. I know our schools. I know how good they are. I know the reform they're implementing. I know how innovative they are. So I would ask you to know that when I talk to you, I know what I'm talking about. And we have incredible teachers. We have great principals, and we have strong fiscal and educational leadership. I'm set the stage. Thank you. Let's take a short break right here and uh, introduce anybody that wants to be introduced. This is Senator Neville back here. Two fingers. Dr. Music, Contra High School. Uh, Laura Boggs, school board member. Anybody else? Don Smith or Chamber Director, Chamber Exactly. And Cliff, working the video. <laughs> it's really into it, see? Oh. <laughs> okay, and this is Sheila Atwell, who's uh, representing Jefferson County Students First Action, and her 10 minutes. Right. You can have a helper if you want. Well, that's right. I think I'll, I'll start off. If I, need to call, if I need to call a friend to phone a friend, I might do that. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me here. Um, so I'm uh, uh, the mother of two, a third and sixth grader at Evergreen uh, Montessori. And Jeffco Students First Action is a nonpartisan, nonprofit foundation dedicated to uh, education reform in Jefferson County. Um, now, if there's one thing we all agree on, it's the utmost importance of excellent public schools. In, for the vitality of the economy, for the prosperity of the nation, if you will, for the value of our homes and all of that. Um, so, and I got involved in education reform. I think a lot of people, I think, question perhaps what, what I'm doing, why I'm doing this. And I've always been very philanthropic my whole life and uh, have been on a board that offered uh, scholarships to children in Africa for many, many years. And seeing the economy going where it's going and thinking the only reason our country is quite as, as uh, generous as it is is because it's so prosperous. And why is it prosperous and how do we main that, maintain that prosperity? It's maintaining educated, great uh, students and, and uh, educated workers and voters that know uh, how to uh, apply their, and do their civic duty. Um, and something, I guess I'm a bit of a contrarian because the whole uh, idea that school funding has been reduced, I've seen a lot of the reform movies and they show all these figures about how much more money is actually being spent. So I thought, I'm going to do my own homework. And I got a comprehensive annual financial report right here, which not, uh, it's a little tricky to understand, but the, one of the nice things is they, it does show year over year changes. And what I will say is there's a big difference between budget cuts and actual spending cuts. And what I found was spending has increased every year through 2011. Yes, it did finally go down now, but prior to that point, it increased at a rate um, faster than inflation, because I know people's question is always then, well, what about inflation? Things cost more. Well, um, that may be true, but the, uh, um, the spending did increase uh, up just up until 2011. Now, the district does have a moral obligation to spend taxpayer funds prudently. And I know uh, Mr. Bell yesterday uh, said he wished education funding were recession-proof. And I guess what that kind of means to me when I hear that is that school districts and employees should be insulated from economic reality and uh, the recession that will affect all the other people who do take the tax increase. And let's talk a little bit about the fact that businesses pick up three and a, uh, 75 percent, over three times as much as what the individual homeowner will pay of this tax. Um, you talk about a cup of coffee the average homeowner might have to give up in order to pay for uh, the tax. Well, what about the 
the dentist or the veterinarian that owns their building and them having to maybe not maintain their receptionist or restaurant not being able to hire an extra bus person because they have to pay the higher tax. So businesses are struggling. We know foreclosures are up and unemployment Jeff Jeffco has doubled in the last five years. And a recent um, Colorado Department of Labor report just came out. And last year, the average income in Jefferson County went down 3.9%. Now, I understand the, edge of the district employees took a 3% pay reduction. That was in exchange for fewer days worked, of course. But it's less than what your average citizen in the, the district has, has uh, experience. So until the high water spending point in 2010, those compensation costs, like I mentioned, climbed faster than the rate of inflation. And now that the economy is slowing, we could have probably predicted that. Um, now we all know money and resources are important to schools, and, but money is not the answer to improve student achievement. We're still not graduating 20% of our kids. I know that uh, the ones that do graduate, still about a quarter need remediation. So in terms of, of of excellence, uh, you can determine whether or not that's good enough. We don't think that's good enough. We think everyone should have um, an equal opportunity and it just doesn't appear that way. It's hard to understand that argument up here in Conifer because we have one of the best high schools in the district. Evergreen's one of the best high schools. So hearing that argument, then that must mean that there are some lower performing schools that are pulling the average down. Because yes, indeed, our averages are a bit higher than the state average, but at 56% now, I guess it is, um, of 10th graders not being proficient in math, again, I, I think we can aim higher, I think we can do better with some structural change. Um, one area where we do rank um, highly is 13th out of 178 school districts in the total mill levies we collect. We collect in Jefferson County about 48. The average school district in the entire state collects 37. That's 30% higher. Um, now when it comes to the $39 million uh, mill levy, it doesn't cover the $46 million in cuts that we've talked about. And something that uh, is interesting to me is that just last year, you know, we did this big budget thing, and we had, were told that we had to cut 70 million. Well, funding didn't go down, so now we only have to cut 46 million. And I'm just curious why that 46 number is any more accurate than the original 70 million dollar pay reduction. And we know that a big bulk of it goes to parent increases, and I been told and I've read the, the criticism that no, it's not designated to para. But if it's in the budget and the para increases are happening, the increase in taxes will ultimately go there. And just, um, and I know the argument also is that dis the district can't do anything about it. But what I have here, I printed this out when I went to the Lakewood School Board meeting before it because I wanted to look and what are we talking about and cuts and how do you prioritize? Number five on here. The mandated 0.9% annual increase of para contributions will be paid by employees, and 4.5 million will be saved. Now, I don't know how this could have gotten on the list if it wasn't legal. I, I mean, I would imagine that the parents that were presented with this were presented with it because it was an actual um, potential cut to be made. Uh, the very last item on here are furlough days. Well, after the closed union negotiations, uh, the parent increases were completely removed and the furlough days were number two. So parents, or rather adults or students, I'm saying they selected putting the um, adults in the system first in this case. Um, parent contributions have gone up astronomically, five times the rate of inflation, not outside of the, the compensation increases. Um, you can't have it both ways though, complain about reduced funding and not address these really, really huge pieces of the budget. By 2018, PARA will be 17% of the general fund budget. Um, now one thing about this, what, I, what I, I'm curious, or something that struck me is saying that you can't spend the, um, how was it put, bond redemption fund money um, for general fund purposes. But I think what's maybe happened is they've reduced the money, it should have been operational money, I think, that pays for HVAC repair and leaky roof repair. That should have been ongoing expenses. So what we did instead, or I should say the district, is increase ongoing expenses and reduce the amount of money that should have been spent on maintenance. So it is a way to sort of take one from one pocket and put it in the other. Now, this item right here I find really interesting because one of the points I was going to make about spending bond money on maintenance, which is an interesting model to um, have uh, taken up, <coughs> I was going to say that kids this age right here will be paying 20 years from now for an HVAC system that maybe isn't even working if they stay in Jefferson County and they're 
married and they're living here and because it's beautiful and most people come back to Evergreen because it's awesome and conifer. Um, well, that would be really interesting to see them pay higher <coughs> tax payments, I think, in 20 years' time. But um, So I would imagine, though, with rates as low as they are, they would probably finance at a good low rate. But we'll see. Um, so again, we're talking about the return on investment. It's how money spent. It's not how much money. And truly, it, we don't have any problems spending money if it's spent in the right places and for great, excellent uh, schools and for really um, actual structural reform. So um, that's kind of where we're at. This is uh, when the economy improves and home values rise again, the income to the district will rise again. And so that's uh, what has to happen. Economic reality hits all of us, and I don't understand why necessarily the school district should be insulated from that. And I understand that the district has made a point of threatening instrumental music and outdoor labs and created a crisis to make it seem like a panic that, oh my goodness, we must must raise taxes. But as I said, already the tax of the cuts, the suggested budget cuts, again, that doesn't necessarily mean actual spending cuts, um, could be different than 46 in 13, 14. So um, I'm a little bit skeptical, and I guess that's that's part of the issue for me. So thank you. You're pretty close. Am I close? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for another five? I'm ready. Oh, where do I begin? Okay, I'm going to talk really fast, so you ready? When we talk about our employees and open negotiations, I have to tell you, you have the best employees in any school district in the state. Our employees stepped right up said, we get it, we'll take a 3% reduction. And so, when people say there's nothing illegal about them paying more para, we could negotiate that if we were negotiating increases, negotiate a 3% increase and 1% goes to Paris, so our employees only get 2%. But our employees have taken a 3% reduction. You have two of your principals right here, who their checks are 3% less than they were two years ago. Now, I want to keep them in the school district, and I've been looking at principal salaries. I don't want to lose our best and our brightest. That's the first thing. Second thing, when you talk about JUCO and innovation and reform, I could do an hour on that. Our strategic compensation pilot, which is looking at pay for performance. Our career pathways that help kids know where to go in their future and what do they need to do now to be ready for it. Our graduation rate. We are tied for second place in 2009 with Fairfax County. Now, Fairfax County is the second wealthiest county in the nation, and we are tied with them. Now they have to recalculate everything to make it comparable, but we are doing an awfully good job with our kids. Our high school neighborhood graduation rate, neighborhood school graduation rate last year was 86%. So yes, we have a variety of kinds of kids in Jeffco, and you know what? That's one of our greatest strengths, and we love it. Our teachers every day go and do amazing work with children. So, when people talk about 10th grade math, let's be clear. Jeffco has 42% advanced and proficient. Cherry Creek this year has 43%. Jeffco's poverty rate is 33%. Cherry Creek's is 26%. It gets even better than that. Because, I'm sorry, that's wrong. We're 42, Cherry Creek is 41. Douglas County, with an 11% poverty rate, is 43%. So Cherry Creek 41, Jeffco 42, Douglas 43. Now, poverty rate, 26, 33, 11. If that doesn't speak well of the work we're doing. Now, next question. So why do we have a budget problem? Here's the bottom line. In 2009, we had $761 more per child from the state of Colorado than we will have next year. Our expenditures for 11, 12, and 12, 13 will be below 07 and 08. That, those are the solid numbers. So why did our expenditures go up? Because we spent down our reserves, 73 million that we were smart enough to build, strategic enough. We had one-time money from the federal government. We had one-time money that helped us soften the blow for our kids and our teachers. We had $65 million worth of reductions defined for the coming school year and the year after that. We had a very courageous Board of Education that listened to the community and said, we have heard from our community the kinds of things they want to preserve in our schools. Music, great teachers, rational class size, 
choices at our high school in the arts and electives, and we're going to do it by taking $7 million more out of Central, spending $5 million more of reserves, $5 million out of our employee compensation, and let's see what I'm missing something, seven, two, two, two. you have to come up with it, 20 million without impacting our classrooms. However, we can't do that in another year. In another year, we are looking at 45 million worth of reductions. That is not a threat. That was the work of 3,000 people who put together an extensive list who said, these are the things we're going to have to do. Now I'm gonna close with this. I told you I've been in schools yesterday and today. And every elementary school I went to yesterday, which was four of them, I made a point of getting into the kindergarten. And here's why. They're the class of 2025. I can't even begin to describe to you the moral responsibility we have as a school district and a community to make those children not only smart and knowledgeable, but creative, imaginative, and great problem solvers. Class of 2025. And I will tell you, when I walk in there, and I see the class sizes we have right now, and I think kindergarten, first, and second grade, how important they are to win my chasm as high school kids, what a difference it makes. And that's where my passion comes from. It reminds me why I'm here tonight, why I'm spending my vacation time talking about this, because I am in the schools. I do know what goes on in our classrooms. And I can tell you, our great teachers, our great principals, our kids, and our families, they're worth it. And you know what? It's only going to cost you, oh, about 10 cents a day property tax increase on that $250,000 home. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. teachers and all of that should be well compensated and should not uh, be facing cuts and we should do everything we can to keep them. The trouble is the tax increase we're talking about and the parent increases and the buying back furlough days does not leave money in it to pay for all of those things and to save all of those things. And I'm still questioning whether or not there are other things that could be cut besides uh, the instrumental music and the outdoor labs and the librarians and all of that. And so, so what Jeff Co students first espouses really is more market-based pay, things like this to structurally change the way uh, compensation is awarded. Quite frankly, you guys, I have heard fantastic things about you. Um, and so I wouldn't even suggest that you need to take a pay cut at all. I don't understand why you wouldn't, get, as the best and the brightest, be incented to stay more and uh, perhaps other principals and other ones that are not as effective have um, compensation decreases. If that's the issue, um, if that has to happen, I, I completely agree that, that well, um, highly effective principals and highly effective teachers should be well compensated, should be compensated better than they are now. Uh, but it's hard to do that when there's no accountability on the other side for those that are ineffective. And I guess perhaps nobody in this room knows any teachers that are ineffective, but I would say that I've, I've heard stories of, of folks, even at, at grade schools, a uh, parent of twins, saying I'd like to have them both in different classes and having a huge difference in the quality of education between the two teachers. So how do we repair that? That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, getting rid of the great teachers. And, and I'm not demonizing teachers. Your job is hard. And I think that to know that everyone's working as hard and to the same degree is better and it's more of an incentive. But um, that's that's just my, my take on it. But. Again, right now in this economy, when you have so much of uh, tax increases on the horizon, to just add one more layer just doesn't seem fair to our local businesses and our um, community. And truly, I've, I've read all the excellent uh, the work that, that's been done on the presentations that we've seen. And in terms of higher mill levies, meaning higher property values, I, um, I read some of those studies, and or I looked at the one actually that referred to that specifically, and it does show a correlation between mill levies and property values, but just because redheads have freckles doesn't mean that freckles cause the red hair. So I, I didn't see that the linkage at all. And of course, great schools mean better property values, but it's what makes a great school, I guess. Great principals, great teachers, um, great parents, no question. Um, but when we have, um, 
there's so much more that can be done, I think, and we just need to aim higher than what we're doing right now. And I just don't see that. I understand that there are some compensation um, uh, studies being done in the district right now as part of a reform effort, but without any accountability on the flip side, again, I don't see how those things can actually work, and there simply isn't any urgency. It doesn't seem to me um, to do those, to make those reform steps. And again, we're, we're here that, that everyone's pulling together, but I'm not entirely sure that that's borne out also by the fact that a lot of the uh, time the union spend at the Capitol is to directly uh, block any kind of reform to PARA or any kind of reform. SB 191, which is something that's touted quite frequently, is the pay for performance and all of that. That was harshly um, battled by, by some of the status quo folks in the system. And so to say we want what's best for our kids and then to do those sorts of things, doesn't it just doesn't match up. So that would be my take on it. I said everything. Have I forgotten anything in the room? My call phone of friends. All right, well, thank you. That time's coming right up. Right, to do this in a fair and balanced manner, would you like to uh, take the first set of questions and just for you guys and then just questions for you, or would you rather be all mixed up? We're going to call it that. Whatever. Free for all? I'm, I'm good with free for all. I was a first grade teacher, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with that. And a middle school principal, so you know, we're good. Yeah, not that big. Okay, let's go counterclockwise. Go. Um, she likes to have a question. If this, you don't want to pass this, if we still have to find 46 million in cuts and you don't agree with the cuts that are being proposed, where do you feel you want to cut to find that 46 million? Well, I think, um, I might actually, but I found a friend on that one because someone may notice the budget a little better than I. What, what I'm saying, what we espouse is more of a market-based compensation structure where it's not that every uh, individual in the district gets a pay rise for in particular every year just for being there longer. All the studies basically show that tenure and degrees don't necessarily make a more highly effective teacher. They may, and if folks get those degrees more to be better teachers and then they're more effective and absolutely they should be better compensated. But I think if you have more accountability, is it? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize there's a time to it. Um, if you restructured that way, I think you would find that the budget would make would be a lot more rational. Do you fear if you cut teacher salaries and principals and administrators, you'll lose other teachers and talent to other districts? Or do you think we'll just stay in work for less money? Well, given the current economy that we have, um, one thing I have looked at is the compensation structures across districts. In the early seven years, um, our JEFCO isn't maybe quite as competitive, and I would also like to see that change, quite honestly. But the, in the later years, the comparisons are pretty high. They're pretty good. Jefferson County pays pretty well. So um, I guess it's about uh, looking at the economy and its reality, and if that's what it takes. Um, I, I just actually, I just I have one um, anecdote. A friend of mine um, attends one of the charter schools in, in Evergreen, or the charter school in Evergreen, I guess. And apparently, they lost a couple of teachers, one to retirement, and the other because her husband got a job out of state. Those jobs pay significantly less than the traditional public schools. So again, those are all online. You can see the charts, the pay charts. They were those um, two teaching positions were replaced within five days. So. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying we're talking about weighing the needs of the community and the economy and the needs of students and weighing it all. I just don't see how economic reality can be that school districts can be insulated from it. I have a quick question. So you have um, on your website a, an additional website that now is the No on 3A, 3B Stand Up for Jeffco Students. And while it's called Stand Up for Jeffco Students, the mission says that you are basically taking up for the already beleaguered taxpayer. So can you reconcile for me exactly what you're doing with that um, messaging? question. I, it's not actually my our website. Well, you've linked to it, and mm -hmm. it, it's under where you talk about all your messaging on different topics. 
and you have three A three B on DEFCO students first, and then you link to this website as your information on on three A three B, and it says that the mission of this stand up for DEFCO students is to fight for the all right, I, I don't know if it's beleaguered or um, something like that, taxpayer. So I'm just having trouble with stand up for Death Coast students well, it's versus same. fighting for the taxpayer. I just want to know, is your mission to do things better for the students of Death Coast? It is. Or is it to do things better for the taxpayer? It is to do things better for the students. I guess I would change that on the website. Okay, thanks, Counterclockwise. Dawn has a question. Yeah, um, from a chamber member, um, each of you could just talk a little bit about, um, her, to use her word, underfunded para. If you could just address that so I could take notes and send that back her way. That's a vague question, I know, but just some talking points. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, para, for those of you who are not familiar, is the Public Employees Retirement Association. It is governed by statute. And for some reason, it has become attached to our Jeffco teachers. Well, let me be clear. It's teachers across the state. It's state patrol. It's our judges. It's all of our state employees. It's a huge number of people. The average pension in Para is $34,700 a year. That is not an extravagant pension. Employees pay in 8%. In the coming year, we will pay in 15.65%. There is an argument, and I'm going to say it is an argument. One side of the argument says PARA is not funded appropriately. Another side says it is. If we want to have a conversation about PARA at the state level, that's perfectly acceptable behavior for a population of the state and for state policy. So, so you can get on the PARA website, and they will tell you there what they say. And I can't, I'm sorry, I can't decide it exactly. You can also look at their auditor's reports, you can look at their return on investment, and you can look at what some people say they're underfunded and other people say they are not so underfunded. Now, I, my job is not to defend PARA, but my job is to say there are certain pieces of facts that have been used and they have been twisted and they're not the truth. So one of the things that has been said about our mail levy override is that 20 million is going to go to PARA. No. Our budget goes out five years, and the $4.9 million increase is built into the budget. Our para budget is part of employee compensation. So when everybody says, well, it needs to be part of compensation, it is part of compensation. We tell our employees, this much goes into para. And so para is there, it is governed by statute. The underfunded piece, you can look at what the argument is, and you can look on the PARA website, and you can look at the arguments against it. I would refer pe people to the PARA website to start with. The thing I think is important for Jeffco to remember is that, and Sheila said it, she said, are we looking at adult needs or are we looking at child needs? We can have a civil conversation about PARA and how it should be funded and how it should be structured and should there be changes in the law. But we are also talking about 85,000 kids. And 85,000 kids who each year are going to see loss if we don't have these dollars. And, and I am passionate about it. So. Thank you. You know, we're uh, fortunate to have Art Barnard here. Art's a retired state controller. In fact, my wife has a check at home that she would have cashed us because my company's name is Treasurer and Art's controller. Could you shine some light on that? Well, on PARA? Yes, sir. Well, I'm a PARA recipient, so I am concerned about the future of PARA. Uh, there are issues, uh, like the superintendent said, that really are beyond the discussion that we're talking about here. Uh, the school district really has no control over what happens in PARA. PARA will be. Uh, those issues will be resolved uh, by the legislature and by the courts uh, if it comes to that. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's, a, it's an issue that's being faced across the country with, with the fine benefit pension uh, plan. But my question, actually, Robert, was with the 90, 1992 bonds, uh, we have $33 million of uh, debt service going away. 
and we had four to four and three quarters mill mill levy associated with that. Is that is that mill levy automatically uh, reduced or eliminated when those bonds are retired, or is it a possibility that that levy could continue and be used for some other purpose? Good question. I, I wouldn't think so. But I, I have the answer for you. Okay. The answer is that by law, the mill levy does not have to be reduced because the district has other outstanding obligations. So the statute states that the district could keep that mill levy. Remember, they can only use it to pay bonds. So what they will then do is pay off outstanding bonds at a faster rate. They could do that. Some districts do that here. This district has never adopted that policy. So far, to date, the district has said if we have a payoff or reduce, a reduction in our mill levy and our bond redemption fund, we will reduce that accordingly. Now that's been the practice. The law allows you to do otherwise. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, and just so to be clear, the you? district doesn't decide that, the Board of Education does. Board of Education District, there you go. You decide. All right, on the solvency of the pair of funds, yes. is it or is it how close? Well, the, the real issue is their rate of return. We're in a low, very low interest rate, very low return environment. And they're presently, I believe, uh, planning on an average of 7.5% return on their investment. Well, I thought they had lowered it. Okay, 8%. I guess it used to be eight percent. Uh, yeah, that's is that the question is that realistic or not? No one knows. Paris averaged close to ten percent over the past thirty years. What's going to happen in the future? Well, as you I know, don't know. I'm allergic to defined benefit plans of all kinds. <laughs> Let me say, I'm gonna say a couple things about Paris. That's okay, Robert. Um, just uh, that's all right. Um, you know, and I only say this not not to, to say whether it's, it's good or bad, but the pair, pair benefit is quite generous. You said the average benefit is thirty thousand. The 30, average thirty four seven. Thirty four seven. Well, <clears throat> that's even better, isn't it? The um, average Social Security benefit, I believe, is something like twenty one thousand a year, and I think Social Security recipients can't collect until they're sixty five, whereas pair beneficiaries can collect at fifty five. And the 8% uh, contribution that teachers pay is very similar to the 7.65% social security, social security tax paid in the private sector. So they equate pretty closely. I understand that, that the district employees don't get social security, but private employees get anything close to as generous as PARA. And PARA can go upwards of seven times as, as, uh, as well over maybe four times as generous. As, as private retirement or social security benefits. I actually just read an article, um, and, and the point of that is that, the, uh, like we said, the employees could pick up more than 8% of the uh, pair contribution. I know you said it has to be offset by a pay rise, but you had it on here, so I'm thinking that you could offset it by the furlough day, say, making sure that income, or rather the compensation would change, and yet you'd be in the classrooms two more days with the students that, that probably uh, deserve and need two more days in the classroom. Um, so that's that's the issue we're talking about. It's not what's fair, it's, it's just math. There just isn't enough. And by 2018, the contribution from the taxpayer is 20%. And the uh, employees are still at 8%. And I just read an article about a, a um, school district in Ohio that actually has on their ballot a reduction in mill levies. It's kind of interesting. And in it, they were saying that the uh, employees should pick up more than 11%, which is the contribution rate in this Ohio district. So the 8% uh, contribution and the benefit are really kind of out of sync. I mean, it's an extremely generous benefit that also um, adds to the compensation level. Well, I would have to say that some other states, uh, the local government unit entities, are not only paying into their state pension fund are also paying Social Security. In Colorado, we do not pay Social Security, and so there's a savings there. Going clockwise. So, 
the one that's expiring, the 1992, that's for capital expenditures. Yes. So the three point, the three A, the forty million, is that replacing something that is expiring, or is that going to be an increase? Why is that additional forty million necessary if there's nothing expiring that it's replacing? Well, it's the, it's making up for the reduction in state funding. So there are two different questions. It's a great question. There are two different questions. The the mill levy override goes straight for operational funds. And our operational funds on, on our funding from the state is down $761 per child. So if you think about that between 2009 and 2012, and I don't even beat up on the state, they're, they're trying to make the world work as well. So between 2009 and 2012, we've lost $761 per child. So if you think about that in Jeffco with approximately 80 to 81,000 funded students, that's over $60 million lost in operational expenses. So you've seen, you've seen reductions that we cushion through the use of the reserves and through one-time funds. But they're gone. So we're at the point where there's nowhere else to turn. And we've really been strategic, and we've been very efficient. And in fact, you know, people say we have all these administrators, reduce your administrative expenses. There are only 133 people like Steve and me, people who don't work in schools every day, all day, who are administrators. And I'm support staff, but administrative staff for 12,000 full and part-time employees. So, so we're at the point where we've reduced things that I'm very uncomfortable with, like safety and security. We've reduced IT. We've reduced all of our departments, and the board did another $7 million, which I supported. So we're at the point of saying there aren't a lot of places to go. Our last place to go was compensation and our employees. I will tell you, when you talk about open negotiations, you can see how well things are working in Douglas County right now. And that's for a lot of reasons. There are a lot, there's lots of conflict. Our employees did it without conflict. So we're at the point where we've done compensation reductions. We've cut 447 jobs. We've, we've been effective and efficient. We've done everything we can do. And I don't know, I'm looking at Wendy and Mike to see if I'm making stuff up. I think they've done everything they can do. I think centrally we've done everything we can do. So that <coughs> A is straight operating expenses. So that puts $39 million into our operating expenses. That goes for things like teachers, materials, technology. And there, there was brought up that we have a $45 million list of reductions, and we're asking for $39 million. Our board thought long and hard, and they do know these are hard times. And could we have gone for 50 and come out and convinced you to give us more? But the issue is, we know it's hard times. We also know this county cares deeply about its children. And what could we do to sustain our reform, our innovation, and our excellence? And keep the tax increase to a minimum. So that that can't that we have to do. The bonds are money that does go to capital for capital expenditures. Normally we come to the community for a bond like Conifer High School and I think it was 92. We came and passed a bond and we got a new Conifer High School. This bond has no new schools, no new square footage. This bond is about keeping our kids safe, warm, and dry. People say, don't you think that should be covered out of your cap or your operational expenses? Quite frankly, we would like to be able to transfer more for regular maintenance. But regular maintenance, when you own 12 million square feet, 12 million square feet, 2 billion, two billion, of assets. Two billion in assets, and you actually own those things, um, regular maintenance is very expensive. So we transfer $23 million a year from operations over to capital, and we use that for safety and security, and, but you can ask Mike and Wendy, there are more things they'd like done in their buildings. Don't think you're going to get them tomorrow, but just check it. Uh, so they're really two separate issues, the 3A and 3B, but because we can reduce the bond mill, we don't have to put as much in the bond, which right. makes up that difference. Right. 
So the bonds are going to be a 20 year payout, so this is obviously a 20 year. Assume so. Assume. That's generally what we do. Okay, the 3A, the other one. Forever. Okay, so that's forever. Okay, so, so, forever. Okay, so, so there's no time limit no. for 8 or no, 12 forever. years. It's until we say forever. enough is enough. No, the, well, yeah. we have it forever, but it gets less and less valuable every year. So well, unless you, property values go up. Yeah. Well, actually, that gets complicated because the state has a formula right. that says this is how much you're going to get. So if you look at an Aspen, they, they almost get no state equalization dollars. Jeffco is far more of a balance. So if you look at an Aspen, because they have so much property, you know, property, <coughs> their money is almost all from local property tax, but they don't get if it goes up or it goes down, they still get the per pupil allocation from the state. So then if you go, for example, to the uh, southwest corner or the western slope when we have some really poverty stricken communities, they get the same amount of money, but they get uh, more from the state and less from their property tax. So if our property values go up, our state equalization goes down. So the only way a community can increase their allocation is to vote themselves a tax increase. Now whether we like the system or don't like the system, that's it. Only Jeff Cobo <coughs> can decide if we want more funding in our schools. Because we will get the state allocation regardless of what happens with our property tax values. So, so we have to make a decision. Do you want to correct anything I said? Nope. Okay. He's my expert. Robert? They're going to throw us out at seven. I've been holding up my hand for a while. Let's pretend. <laughs> Go. Okay, um, I have a, a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, I'm very concerned that everyone's talking nationally about all the debt that our children and grandchildren are going to inherit. So what you're saying by this $99 million here uh, is that kindergartners are going to be paying that off when they're 25 years old. That's what you're asking us to vote on. Is that correct? It's not what I'm asking you to vote on. That's exactly what you're asking. Well, the bond, the bond issues historically have been in the 20 to 22 year term. That's correct. Okay. So what we do in, in public education, and I think in a lot of our community services, is we do pay for those who went before us and those who come after us. So if I look at our Conifer High School, there are people who are going to be paying for Conifer High School who probably don't live here yet. But we have a farmer gathering outside. I never fight with fire people. Um, and, and I think that's a philosophical. I, I do not do not. It's a real life issue. Question. All of us are concerned I think that's about a philosophical it. question, and you're right. It is. But we all pay for the past, and we all pay for the future. Let's take one more minute, and that's over. Um, and that's over. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the crowd, but I didn't have to play my concertina. <laughs> I actually would like you to play it, if you're willing. Damn, go. Yeah, you just two comments. Number one, there was a question regarding uh, students and what we can do for students and what we, how we support students. To me, the most important thing that we can do uh, to support students and their success is to have an economy that actually provides jobs for them after they get out of school. And I think that's the challenge that we have, and that's the thing we need to look at balance. One other thing I wanted to, to mention, we're talking about a tax increase. Joe's standing up back yeah. here. <laughs> the, big, the big issue that we're going to be facing in Jefferson County, uh, based upon the Heritage Foundation, is the increase in federal taxes that we're going to face. An average for Jefferson County, for this, this congressional district, an average of $5,633 in new federal taxes for next year per tax return. I think people need to consider that very good. Well, be sure you sign up and uh, get their email on the list. I'm sorry, be on the next. And thank you again.